So then, as we return to our study in the book of Acts, we come then, as you heard, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 11, and the focus of my message today is the final verse of that section, verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life, or repentance unto life. The title of the message is Repentance Unto Life, and I urge you not to click off your minds too soon. Unfortunately, we in our Americanized evangelical culture, when we hear a phrase like repent or repentance, we automatically assume we think we know what that means, when in fact, <clears throat> because of the cultural distance that exists between us and the time in which these things were written, unfortunately, these terms have become somewhat distorted, if not slightly misunderstood. You could think of it this way. <clears throat> if um, we were to get in a time machine and travel back to, say, the year 1850, not a vast amount of time, but far enough back in time to where if you walked up on a street corner and what would have been then downtown Greenville, however it existed then, and said to somebody, where's the shopping mall? I'm not sure they would have understood what you asked. Now, they might understood the term, they would have understood the term shopping, and maybe they might have some concept of what a mall is in 1850. I don't know. But I can guarantee you, it would, they would not hear you saying what you mean when they heard those phrase shopping mall, because they would have no way of equating it with their experience 150 years ago. And I want you to see, as we study this passage, that terms like repentance and life are in the same sort of category. Among the, um, the distinctive attributes that have set these United States apart from all other nations were the principles of liberty and freedom. Now, right away, you may be thinking, well, where, where in the world is this going? I thought this was about repentance unto life. Please, be patient. Bear with me. Our founding documents, such as the Declaration of Independence, made a very important provision, though, about the idea of freedom and liberty. These documents recognize that liberty could be preserved only under this one condition, that the new confederation of states acknowledge their dependence upon God and his law as given in Holy Scripture. Now, in Holy Scripture, there is a word that speaks to us of the genuine freedom offered to us by Almighty God. And this word is really one of the key words in all of Scripture. It's a word that is the key to spiritual life, growth, and true freedom. It's a word that makes it possible for us to know the truth that sets us free. And this word describes the very idea upon which our belief in Christ is built. And practicing the, the concept or the idea back of this word is the only thing that will keep your mind open to the discovery of truth. And it is a word that is symbolic of how the Lord gives us the ability, the very ability, to change our minds regarding our habits and our lifestyle. It is the one thing that we should pray that God would grant us the ability to do throughout our lives. And as you may know by now, it is the word repent. Well, now let's understand a few things about that word and what it means. And this is all, by the way, by, in, by way of introduction. We're, we're heading to the major points that I want to make about this passage, but I need to lay this groundwork first. By analyzing the meaning of that single word, Martin Luther transformed the religious landscape of his day and for the rest of human history. Because for hundreds of years prior to Luther, the word repent had been taken to mean do penance and feel bad about yourself. For over a thousand years, when European people who could read, read the Latin text of the Bible, or when they heard it preached or taught, that was how the word repent was translated, to do penance and to feel grief and sorrow for your sins. But Martin Luther went back to the copies of the ancient manuscripts in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, and he made an astounding discovery. 
Luther's astounding discovery was that repent did not actually mean to do penance. No, as the Greek term used that we translate as repent indicates, it means rather to change the mind. It means to think again or in a new way, to look at everything differently. Now, lest you think that this is somehow emptying the traditional Reformed understanding of what repentance is all about, let me suggest to you that you, you try this experiment. The next time you find yourself heading off in a direction to do something or say something for which you would need to, quote, repent, you notice how your inclination or your temptation to do that begins as a process in the mind. Another thing Luther discovered was this. He discovered that wherever we read Jesus using this word, it most always is linked with another. And that word is belief. Repent and believe. However, even that phrase is subject to being misunderstood for reasons that I said as we began. Especially by us today. Because when we hear that phrase, we automatically, I think, assume, many of us do, that it means something like this. When we hear repent and believe, here's how we filter it and translate it into our minds. Feel bad about all the bad things that you do and start agreeing that the doctrines of the Bible are not false but true. When we hear repent, we hear feel bad about your sins and feel sorry for them. And then we hear believe, we hear Start agreeing that the doctrines of the Bible are true and not false. Now, I'm not going to say that <clears throat> none of that is involved in repenting and believing. But I am going to say that, friends, that is not by a long shot how that phrase was used or understood by Jesus and his followers. Because their understanding would have been more along these lines. Repent and believe means stop following the wrong path of life, change the direction to the new way of Jesus, and commit yourself, mind and body, to him and his way. And again, unless you think this is some sort of stepping away from traditional theological understanding, let me quote to you from no less honorable a source than the time-honored systematic theology of Louis Burkhoff, who wrote... True repentance never exists except in conjunction with faith. I would also put parenthesis belief. While on the other hand, wherever there is true faith, there is also true repentance. He said the two are but different aspects of the same turning, a turning away from sin in the direction of God. The two cannot be separated. They are simply complementary parts of the same process. Now, in his research, Luther asked himself, how did Jesus, how did Paul and the people of those days use these words? What did they understand them to mean? Repenting and believing are two words married to one another throughout Scripture. A true attitude of repentance keeps our minds open to a healthy discovery of the truth. And the ability to change our minds through repentance is the only thing that will bring us spiritual freedom in Christ. And the gravest mistake that is made in many religious circles, especially those of Luther's time, was their buying into a specific view or understanding of Scripture and becoming so devoted to their understanding that it warped their perception of the entire Bible. And friends... Don't think that this is a problem that was only an issue for the medieval Roman Catholic Church. Because we face the same problem today. The last time I checked, Scripture does not teach that our man-made constructed systems of theology and creeds and confessions are infallible. The Westminster Confession of Faith does not pretend to be infallible. So let me say that again. The gravest mistake made in the religious circles of Luther's day was their buying into a specific understanding or theology or interpretation of Scripture and then becoming so devoted to that one understanding that it warped the perception of the entire Bible. 
Maybe another way to say that is this. It's easy to learn a little and then close your mind to all that there is to know. And this is why it's so important to maintain an attitude of repentance as we seek God. Repentance requires us to look at what we know in light of what we have just learned and in light of who we are. Repentance is the God-given desire to change directions. The ability to repent through godly sorrow is one of the greatest gifts God can bestow upon us. Repentance is not just turning away from sin. It is turning toward that which is right. It is exchanging a wrong way of living for a right way of living in the process of conversion. Back in 1921... Actually, from 1921 to 1925, that four-year period, Pat Morris Neff was governor of the great state of Texas. On one occasion during his governorship, he decided to visit one of the largest state penitentiaries in Texas to speak to an assembly of all the convicts. And when he had finished, he said that he would remain behind and that any, if any of the convicts wanted to come and speak to him privately, he would gladly listen to them. And he further assured them that anything they told him in confidence would be kept absolutely confidential. And that nothing any of them would say would be used against them. Well, when the meeting was over, the formal meeting, a large group of these convicts stayed behind to talk to the governor. Many of them, not all, but many of them were serving life sentences. And you know, one by one, as they came up and spoke to the governor, each one of them said things like, look, I was framed. You need to get me out of here. There's a grave injustice in what happened to me. The judge made a mistake. The lawyer made a mistake. And please let me go. Finally, one of the convicts came up to the governor and said, Mr. Governor, I just want to say that I am indeed guilty. I did what they sent me here for. But, sir, I believe that I have paid for it. And if I were granted the right to get out, I would do everything I could do to be a good citizen and prove myself worthy of your mercy. Now, that was, of course, the man whom the governor pardoned that year. In our Westminster Shorter Catechism, the whole idea of repentance unto life is summed up in these words, and this is from question and answer number 87. Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sins turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Friends, anybody who studies that answer, you, you could teach a course for three semesters on all the content of that marvelous, marvelously summarized statement. But let, let's maybe come up with a, a shorter, more, more concise way as best we can to say what that question and answer says. And it would be this. At least I'm going to make this effort. True repentance has two parts. It looks upon things past with a weeping eye and upon the future with an expectant, hopeful, watchful eye. Having said all of this now, I want to make the following five points. First of all, Repentance is granted by God. Back in Acts chapter 10, God led both Peter and Cornelius to see his new direction for their lives. And in, and in Acts chapter 11, Peter explains his actions as God led him into the house of the first Gentile converts to Christ. He's explaining himself to these Jewish believers who've come from Jerusalem because they've heard about what's going on and they're very suspicious. And Peter stressed to them, he emphasized to them the visions and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. Listen as I reread verse 18 from a different translation. When the others, that is these, these Jewish Christians who had come from Jerusalem, heard this, they had no further objections. They praised God by saying, Then God has also led Gentiles to turn to Him. So Now, now notice how this translation does it. I, I really like this because it, it catches what I'm trying to say here, I think. God has also led Gentiles to turn to him so that they can change the way they think and act and have eternal life. Repentance for both Jew and Gentile was made possible by means of divine intervention. And this is the very purpose of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To grant us the ability to choose to return to God 
through repentance. Second major point, repentance requires an awakening. Repentance is granted to us by God. It is a gift from God. And secondly, it requires an awakening. Now, for some people, they don't want to hear what Scripture says about their moral or ethical condition, their status in life, because it makes them uncomfortable. Now, it is true that the Bible does compel us to face up to ourselves, and it shows us how God views the worst aspects of our lives, the, the diseases of our souls, as someone once said. But the Bible does more than that. It also offers us an alternative way of living. Or, as our catechism so well put it, it shows us that we need to endeavor after a new obedience. Thirdly, well, excuse me, that, this isn't the third point. This is a, a point underneath this third point. Repentance gives us the ability to rethink the way we live, therefore. Repentance requires an awakening of the mind. God awakened Peter and Cornelius. Both of them were spoken to by God in a vision. Now, if we are planning to change the way we are living, it's necessary to see what is wrong with the way we are or have been living. And so we must awaken to a new way. And that is what repentance is. This is what the revelation of God in the Bible is designed to do. It's not so much written to make us cringe but to give us a new direction for living. Now, cringing may be part of that process, but the main goal is to change the way you think, change your direction, and follow in the way of Jesus. The Bible is written to give us a new focus by awakening us to the ways of God. Jew and Gentile, turn to Christ in repentance. They were required to die to their old way of living and awaken to God's new direction through Christ. Jesus described it this way in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, to spoil. I have come that my followers can have life in overflowing abundance. Through repentance, we discover the abundant new life that we have in Christ. But let's also realize that God did not grant Jew and Gentile repentance because of their goodness. He granted repentance because of their ungodliness, their ungoodness, if I can use that phrase. The Jews had crucified Christ. Peter talked about this in Acts chapter 2. And the Gentiles totally denied God. Rome, uh, Romans 1, where Paul speaks of this. Both were totally committed, therefore, to a way of living that could only end in destruction. One was no better than the other. And frankly, neither of them is any better than you are or I am. Paul, writing in Romans 2 verse 1, says, You may think you can condemn such people. But you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself, for you judge others and do the very same things. You see, in Romans 1, 28 to 32, he's talking about the, the fallen condition of the Gentiles and their idolatry and their sexual perversion, who've forsaken the inborn knowledge that God gives them of himself. But then in Romans 2... He applies the same verses to the Jews who are passing judgment on the Gentiles. Both are enslaved to a futile way of thinking, but now God has granted repentance to both alike. Repentance gives even the worst of men hope for a new way of living, a new way of life. Thirdly, thirdly, now this is the third point, repentance brings freedom. Repentance is a gift or granted to us from God. Repentance requires an awakening Thirdly, repentance brings freedom. Why is it that we spend so much money on welfare and poverty programs? Why is it that we spend so much money fighting crime and, and violence in the streets? We've got to awaken to the real problems we face, and money won't solve those problems. Social programs don't do anything or very little to alleviate the problems. See, we don't have money problems. We have moral problems. And it's time we stood up and faced the truth. By doing what God's revealed word prohibits, we become trapped and enslaved. Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And since we've all sinned, we're all slaves. And release from that slavery really is quite simple. But it's also very difficult. It's as difficult as letting go of the very thing that you want most. And that's our problem with sin. One part of us loves it, and yet we hate its enslavement. Number four, 
Repentance is also for Christians. Repentance is also for Christians. Or we could say, repentance isn't just for the wicked. In Acts chapters 10 and 11, it's not only the Gentiles who are granted repentance. We also see the Christians led to repent as they accept Gentiles into Christian fellowship. Peter is compelled to go into Cornelius' house by the vision from God. And he realizes that repentance now is for everyone. Friends, you see, the real key to reformation in the church lies in our willingness to repent, to change the way we think and to change the way we act. And the church must realize that Christ came to save sinners and act on that knowledge. In the earliest chapters of the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches, one of those letters is to the church at Ephesus. And that's very revealing for us today. Because that church had developed an attitude toward the truth such that they lost their first love for the sinner. I want, to listen, I want you to listen to what it says in verses 2 through 7 of chapter 2. I'm reading this from the New Jerusalem Bible translation. Jesus speaking to that church says, I know your activities, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot stand wicked people and how you put to the test those who were self-styled prophets and apostles and found them to be false. I know, too, that you have perseverance and have suffered for my name without growing idle or tired. Nevertheless, I have this complaint to make. You have less love now than formerly. Think where you were before you fell. Repent and behave as you did at first, or else I will... Or if you will not repent, excuse me, I shall come to you and take your lampstand from its place. It is in your favor, nevertheless, that you loathe, as I do, the way of the Nicolaitans, the way they are behaving. Let anyone who can hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Those who prove victorious, I will feed from the tree of life set in God's paradise. Friends, we must repent and maintain an attitude of repentance. Fifthly, freedom to repentance is costly. Repentance calls for us to give up all we are at the present so that we might become all He is calling us to be. The concept of dying to ourselves and taking up our cross to follow Christ, that's an indication of that cost. When we are baptized into Christ, we commit to a lifelong process of dying to ourselves. Repentance is a commitment to die daily to ourselves that we might experience new life in Christ. I heard about a young man who was a drug addict. Freedom is something that he was wanting quite dearly. We'll call his name John. He longed for and yet feared being free of his addiction. One night he was visiting in the home of a couple who had been ministering to him. They were sitting by the fireplace and John, the drug addict, said, you know, I hate this dependence problem of mine. He said, I know I need to become a really independent person, but I can't imagine being independent, or excuse me, I cannot imagine being not dependent on anything. Well, neither can I, said the wife of the couple. Neither can I. She said, has it ever occurred to you that God might have created us to be dependent? Dependent on something proper and good? You see, friends, Jesus invites us to exchange our dependencies for the liberating burden of his yoke. That's what God and his prophets had been telling the Jews for thousands of years. And it is now also what he is telling the Gentiles. We are all created to be dependent on him. We're all created to worship and serve him alone. We were created, all of us, to be enslaved, in other words. Truth is, though... Being in bondage to God through Christ is the one slavery that will truly set you free. All the others are a phony substitute that will leave you in a dark dungeon of despair. You know, we uh, have just concluded the collegiate basketball season. Very exciting. And I'm reminded of the 1989 basketball season where early, early in that season... There was a basketball game between Michigan and Wisconsin. And in that game, Michigan's star player, Ramil Washington, was called upon to take two foul shots in the closing minutes of the final quarter. 
Michigan trailed by only one point. And it's now up to him to regain and lead Mich- regain the title and lead Michigan to the win. But he failed. He missed both foul shots. Wisconsin came away with an upset victory over one of the best teams of that year. Now, as you might suppose, that basketball player felt terrible. He felt about as low as dirt for losing the game for his team. He was deeply, deeply sorry for what he had failed to do. But there was something different about his sorrow. Because in this case, it wasn't simply limited to just feeling sorry. Because for the rest of that basketball season, after every day's practice session, Ramil Washington stayed late. He stayed behind and he shot 100 extra foul shots for practice. Fast forward a few months later toward the end of the season. He's called upon once more to take two foul shots in a game. This game, though, is very different from the one earlier in that season because this is for the national championship. And at this stage, the game has gone into overtime. There are only three seconds left. Ramil Washington took the two foul shots. He sunk both of them into the net. Michigan won the championship that year. Friends, that man's repentance for his failure was a genuine repentance. A true sorrow had motivated him to work so that he would never make that mistake again. Now listen, if that's what a basketball player can accomplish from mere human sorrow and motivation, just think of what we in the church could accomplish with genuine divine intervention and motivation. Reminds me of a story I read about a group of soldiers in a battle many years ago. The man who was the flag bearer carrying the flag for the regiment had gotten far up ahead of the rest of the soldiers. Well, one of the privates went to the lieutenant who was in charge and said, Sir, do you see the flag? Do you want me to go tell the flag bearer to get back here with the regiment? The lieutenant looked at him and said, Private, We don't need to bring the flag back to the regiment. We need to bring the regiment up to the flag. Friends, as I bring this message to a close, let me observe that we live today in a very sad time in terms of the church. Where all that many people know about traditional, or I won't even use the word traditional, where all that many people know about Protestant Christianity is associated with names like Joel Osteen or Rick Warren. So what we need today are real Christians whose minds have been changed. Followers of Jesus who are endeavoring after a new obedience. We need real Christians to stand up. We don't need to bring the term Christian down to the way it's defined by the church growth and TV preachers. We need to raise the way we live up to the level of the divine love and law of God. Let us pray.